Thanks for coming everybody to this joint seminar between the University of the Highlands and Islands and Orkney Viking Week 2022. So I'm here with both my hats on. <laughs> I'm here as a UHI um, member of staff from the Archaeology Institute and my other hat is uh, from Orkney Archaeology Society and Orkney Time Travel. Um, those two organizations uh, are behind the Orkney Viking Week, which is running for the third year this year. And we're developing and growing as we go along. So um, my name is Ragnhild Juslan, uh, and I'm going to be talking about Viking hiking as a form of tourism. So if I now share my uh, slides, See, share, screen, two. You should be seeing this now. Hiking, hiking, travels in time and space. Yes, so this is um, part of several of my interests, as I said. So um, out with my university job, um, I've been involved in uh, drama, LARP, living history, that sort of thing since my childhood, really. Um, but uh, Orkney Time Travel as an organization started in 2018. Um, and then in my university job, um, I've um, developed a research interest in um, how uh, the past is communicated um, so uh, it's uh, part of this uh, project I've been involved in um, first since 2019 led by Sarah Ellis Nilsson from Linnaeus University and Stefan Nissel from Malmö University both in southwestern Sweden um, I've been working with them first on a book that's coming out sort of now imminent uh, called the Viking heritage and history in Europe coming out on Routledge. Um, but then after after we'd completed that book and sent it off, we, we continued working together. So right now we're um, doing a project alongside many others. I think there's a group of about 36 of us who are working on a book called um, called the uh, Visiting the Past Handbook of Reenactment Practice is the working title. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that there's a couple of people involved in that book are here today. Hello, hello, Heidi and Jean. Um, so um, this uh, seminar today is about um, some thinking I've been doing around uh, how time travel can function as a form of slow adventure tourism and I've written about this in the book um, Viking Heritage and History in Europe um, so it's based on that chapter Viking themed immersive experiences that's what I call time travel uh, so they, they are immersive and they combine slow tourism, nature tourism and adventure tourism with heritage and elements of drama such as dressing up in costume. It relates to nature tourism and slow tourism by prioritizing the sensation of being in the landscape and genuinely experiencing an area and its culture and enjoying simplicity without using up a great deal of resources. So thereby allowing an experience that feels meaningful and feels authentic. And in addition to all that, which can also be achieved by slow tourism, nature tourism. So there's, a, there's another ingredient on top of this in time travel. And that is, of course, it brings in pastness to root the experience in the cultural heritage of the local area. And thereby adding an additional layer of authenticity and meaning. So 
the term time travel has been suggested here uh, because participants experience a temporary sensation of having entered a time and a place in the past and Viking themed um, nature slow tourism exists within a wider taxonomy of time travel that also includes things like um, living history which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, at their best, these immersive engagements with the past in the present, in the intersection between tourism and heritage, offer ways to co-curate and co-create pasts with your participants and grapple with individual and collective identities in the present and together seek routes towards possible futures. Um, however, they also have li limitations, of course, and come with their own set of ethical and practical challenges. So uh, key, some key points there are about inclusion, authenticity, and the role of the participant, how active they're shaping the experience, for example. Um, I'm going to present three time travel events as case studies to show what I mean. And two of them are of my own creation. And the third is by the Norwegian company Hands on History from Trondheim, um, Heidi Karide Brimi, who is here in the seminar today, is one of their team um, and a key person in the Hands on History. Uh, team. So um, all these three case studies invoke a Norse or Viking past. Uh, it's set in the homelands where the figure of the Viking is quite different to the Viking that we see on TV or in films. The Viking is not primarily enacted as a pirate, raider, warrior, destroyer or external enemy, but instead this is a Viking who exists on the more peaceful spectrum of occupations, ages, genders, and social roles. Um, so domestic and everyday activities uh, relating, for example, to food preparation, clothing, textiles, craft, sports, foraging, survival, and storytelling are central. Case one then, uh, Orkney time travel. This is where I'm involved, but without my university hat. <laughs> this is something I'm doing um, in my free time. Uh, and among the things we do, as I said, is organize this Viking festival that we're now in the middle of um, alongside Orkney Archaeology Society. But we also have things on throughout the summer season and occasionally in the winter as well. Uh, one of the more popular things we do that we have been doing every week for the whole summer for the last few years is uh, a thing called Viking Feast on the Beach that lasts two hours. Uh, but we also have other offerings and one is called Viking Voyage to Hoi that lasts for a full day and involves a boat journey and then quite a long hike of three hours and then activities on, on the beach. Um, so um, in neither of these experiences, the participants are passive. They're never passive spectators. It's not a performance. You're not seeing it through a window of pastness that spectators can look into. Sometimes in, in living history, you have the, the performer who's in the Viking Age and doing things like tablet weaving, for example. And then you have the audience, the visitors who come, who are looking through a kind of invisible window into the past, but that this is not how we do it. The, the whole group, the, the guides and the participants time travel together, um, which means we're faced with some choices regarding balancing authenticity with comfort. For example, we have to follow food hygiene rules. Um, we have to follow COVID-19 guidance. So for example, we can't pass around a single big drinking horn. We used to do that to begin with, as you can see in the uh, rightmost picture, but we had to stop that and bring in individual horns instead. Um, 
we have to think about how much time it takes to cook. So how how prepared does the food come before we start cooking over open fire? Um, and as you can also see in the pictures, we've opted for letting guests wear their own clothes and only we, the guides, wear biking attire. And that was also a compromise because we need to make sure that they are warm and dry. So we put the, um, yes, we, we put it on them to, to, to wear uh, rain clothes and warm uh, clothes. But we still achieve pastness in what we do and the stories we tell and the fact that the guides are, are dressed in costume. Um, so um, we've got various versions here. The, the Viking feast on the beach, two hours that don't really have to walk anywhere, but they spend two hours outdoors on the beach where we um, do some cooking over open fire and craft activities and uh, try to make spark with sparks with flint and steel, for example, or um, and then we do storytelling around the fire and some singing and dancing um, and, a, and a fun game. Um, on the bottom right, you see uh, us playing life-size never tavel it's a board game that we're doing with human pieces here um, but more commonly we do axe throwing as our game uh, and the the viking voyage to hoy is involves a three-hour walk through a landscape that has no road um, and then we arrive at the beach at the other side which has a road that goes through it from another direction so that we can drive equipment there. And then we walk to it so that when the guests arrive, the, the fire is set up with, with the tripod and everything. So a question for us was, how much does the walk contribute to the feeling of pastness? Can we, is there something extra about that walking and being in nature? Um, that contributes to a subjective feeling of time travel, the affective authenticity, as I call it. Um, what specifically about walking is biking? <laughs> um, and uh, the feedback we got from our guests is that the nature setting is important for the time travel sensation. And walking is part of that nature setting and embedding yourself in that landscape. Um, but sitting on the beach also contributes, maybe not quite as deep since it's shorter. Um, so people talk in, in the feedback to us about the wonderful landscape, breathtaking, stunning, talk about the seals and birds um, and how we integrate the landscape and the nature into the storytelling that we do. So um, we have been very, um, We've, we've given a lot of thought to how to select stories that are specific to that landscape that we're walking through. So that when we walk through the roadless valley in Hoi, we tell about the everlasting battle, which is a Norse um, story about um, a battle where the warriors are killed every night and re every day for a new battle. Um, and that story is set exactly there where we're walking. So we're, we're rooting the Viking stories from the poetry of the Edda um, in that specific landscape. And then if we see eagles, we'll talk about the eagle at the top of Yggdrasil and so on, and how, how the hills around us are said to have been formed when a troll dropped to cases of, of uh, soil um, so the stories will di be different depending on where we are um, and yeah so this is seascape landscape flora and fauna um, this sensation about using your body to move slowly and feel part of the natural world around you that's what makes it a, a slow adventure and that's very different to the thrill seeking part of adventure tourism, like river rafting, for example, uh, or sailing on a replica Viking ship is more kind of thrill seeking. 
And that leads me to the second case study. Um, so this is uh, Heidi, Brimi, Ingrid, Aune and Richard Åkesson. Uh, they have a bigger team now, I should say, but I, I was writing about this in 2019. So yeah, if you want to, to see who's currently on their team, go to handsonhistory.no where you can also see many more pictures and you can see what they have on offer, what events they have and what they're doing. So they're, they're doing this Viking hiking, but they also work much more broadly in consultation, um, setting, setting things up for planning things for museums and so on, and also film and TV. Um, okay, so go Viking hiking. This is where I stole the title of the seminar from. Go Viking hiking is one of the things that hands-on history does. Uh, in Norway, and that's a much tougher experience. Uh, it's aimed at able-bodied and committed participants. Um, Hands on History call themselves the guerrilla of cultural heritage um, and see their organization as a knowledge experience and action resource bank. That's from their website, involved in teaching, preserving and revitalizing cultural heritage. So what happens in Go Viking Hiking is that participants from all over the world are taken to one of Norway's national parks for a mountain trek over five summer days. So there's three, the three days in the middle are fully spent entirely outdoors and in the wilderness. Uh, adventure and authenticity are the central ingredients here. And when these two combine, uh, the participants are taken very abruptly and deliberately out of their modern comfort zones to the edge of what they thought they could do. They're, for example, not allowed their own clothes. They're all dressed in period attire that the organizer pro provide. You are allowed things like uh, glasses, sanitary products, medicines, and that kind of thing. But apart from that, you're in, in the Viking Age attire. Uh, you spend nights in complete wilderness. Nights are spent outdoors in a shelter that folk build themselves um, out of what they can carry and find and instead of sleeping bags they have reindeer skins um, you can see on the bottom left picture the backpack so the backpacks are also period um, and apart from things like dried meat and peas they need to fish or forage for their food and cook it over open fire which takes a long time they light it without marshes um, and it takes as long as it takes however hungry people are so it's a very ambitious concept much more ambitious than what we're doing in orkney time travel um, so their concept has been described as Viking survivalist, and I was listening to, to um, them describing it on a podcast called Viking Survivalist. Um, uh, and, yeah, and the way it's described there is clear that participants are taken to a very uncompromising past where you are in the Viking age 24 hours a day in everything you do. So the level of commitment from the participants here is very high um, and some of the feeling of pastness and authenticity stems from precisely that deliberate discomfort of sleeping outdoors, carrying equipment without modern rucksacks, wearing wool, getting hungry, getting wet. Um, and because of those high stakes and the high commitment level and the sheer distance away from their everyday life, um, hands on history report that participants come out of this feeling euphoric. Um, so in this podcast, Viking Survivalist, one of their team reflected on it um, by saying that it's as if participants unlock a new level within themselves. They've leveled up. <laughs> um, it's the realization that I made it at the end. I made it. That leads the participants to see themselves in a whole new way. Okay, and case study number three. This is quite different to the other two. It's called the Martyrdom of St. Magnus, and it's an experience I created at first with my university hat on, where we used to do it for summer schools, and then 
in 2017, we ran a much, much bigger scaled up version as a community event where we had 100 participants and reenacted the martyrdom of our local saint here in Orkney, St. Magnus, uh, from 1117, which I know is strictly outside of the Viking Age, but it's a central, pivotal moment in the Orkney saga. Um, so it concerns the rivalry between two earls of Orkney who are cousins, where one cousin murders the other, as we can see in the top picture there, by an axe blow to his head. And Magnus there, um, who's being chopped down, um, became Orkney's local patron saint. So whereas in Go Viking Hiking and Orkney Time Travel, the participants come in as a kind of past version of themselves. So I'm still me, but I'm in the Viking Age. Um, the difference here with Martyrdom and St. Magnus is that it's um, you're in character. So this is, this is LARP uh, live action role playing, but it's uh, recreating a very specific historical moment. Let's describe it in a saga. Um, so, yeah, so that you are a person and you're experiencing that saga episode from that person's first person point of view. So it's a polyphonic story where each character has their own story and they're part of this interwoven story that together is the martyrdom of St. Magnus. It's a polyphonic uh, multi first person story and um, it's set in a small island called Egelsi where the historical martyrdom happened um, and uh, yes and and we had invited for the big community event we had invited very broadly in the Orkney community and um, so we got participants of all ages um, playing opposing earls and their retainers, but also their family members, servants, the hapless cook who was ordered to deal the fatal blow. We can just see the cook's hand in red there. The, the killing itself, the last moment, kind of the last couple of minutes was, was scripted so that Magnus and his rival Earl Håkon both knew what to say and do for the last couple of minutes. But the time leading up to that was improvised, done LARP style, so that everybody just had their character description, their character background, their motivations, their feelings, their loyalties, and so on, um, as a basis for improvising what they wanted to say and do next. And that freedom resulted in some interesting deviations from the Orkning Asaga narrative. In particular, when a group of young participants were sent to spy. So the, the Håkon team sent a group of children to go over to the church and spy on the Magnus team who had taken shelter in the church. Um, but at that moment, when they were supposed to spy, instead of bringing intelligence back, they switched allegiance and revealed themselves to the Magnus team, went into the church and started telling them what the Håkon team were planning. So <laughs> luckily we had a photographer on site who captured this very moment. So this is our young participant who spills the beans to Magnus in red here. Um, and, and I thought that was, that was a fantastic um, thing to happen because it shows how much people took their characters on board and became them and took on that feeling of what would I have done this moment if if this was me and I were there um, and and becoming these young spies and feeling that it feels right to switch allegiance to Magnus here and then just going for it um, uh, yes and and we I as the organizer of this did not take a leading role on the day. I had planned and set up everything beforehand, but once it had started, it just had to run its course, whatever happened. <laughs> um, so, 
moving on to some ethical challenges. Um, so now I'm not talking about one particular case study, but all three and this way of working in general. Um, I think one thing that needs ethical consideration, which hands on history, I've spent a lot of time on and discussed a lot, I know, is um, that the Viking Age is a contentious era of European history, um, which is simultaneously, simultaneously glorified and othered as barbarous. So the Viking Age social mores are centered on kinship, loyalty, honor, values that have not always given rise to positive ideologies or practice in recent times either. Um, for example, the Viking Age values and symbols have been co-opted by Nazi and neo-Nazi ideologists who are attracted to the martial culture of the Vikings that combine, to say it with Neil Price here, combine a violent aesthetic with sworn loyalty and dazzling material culture of killing. Um, so, yes, so there needs to be some careful thinking ar around this, um, which I know hands on history are doing. So they have very careful procedures that they follow. Uh, to try and avoid such uh, dilemmas um, as best they can, not always avoidable. Um, so um, I think both hands on history and working time travel are deliberately emphasizing the positive uh, or the aspects that they find positive about the Viking Age. Um, and that downplays the um, kind of martial uh, honor um, and things like uh, taking slaves and so on that are more negative aspects. Um, so with careful ethical thinking, we can avoid being kind of naively blind, blind to negative aspects of the Viking past um, and by choosing the positive. Um, by carefully choosing what aspects of the past to recreate and to learn from, I feel that is a um, constructive way of choosing what to take forward to contribute to a positive future. So like, what can this give us in the present to learn from and to choose our own future? And then there are further ethical challenges around ac accessibility and inclusion. Um, so some established stereotypes might dictate then that a Viking has a certain appearance and gender, that they should be men with a beard, for example, uh, and that could exclude people with other bodies um, that don't fit the stereotype. So for example, non-white, uh, non-male, disabled, and so on. Um, so time travel can deal with that dilemma, for example, by choosing to separate body and character. So for example, letting a non-white woman in a suitable costume be allowed to take on the role of a Viking sailor, for example, or a male participant to take on the role of a matriarch or, or whatever. Um, in the martyrdom of St. Magnus, we, we did this. We separated body and character and said, when we called out for participants here, invited people to participate, we said, you can choose a male or female character freely. So we ended up, for example, having the cook who deals St. Magnus the fatal blow in the saga that is a male character, but it was played by a female participant. Um, the other way of go going about it is to challenge the stereotype itself. And there we have the backing of recent DNA studies, as well as archaeological research that have more recently shown a more um, extensive cultural contact and ethnic mi mixing in Viking Age Scandinavia that calls for a revision of the stereotype in any case. Um, 
and, and calls for a revision of, for example, women can also be buried with weapons. Um, Vikings don't have to be white and they don't have to be genetically Scandinavian and so on. So time travel is perhaps a good medium to challenge those stereotypes, um, stereotypes that have become established and fastened in our imagination through, for example, film and TV. But here we have time travel and we want to involve a more diverse group of participants. Um, and that's a resource which we can use to challenge stereotypes and rooting it in more recent research. Um, because of its playfulness that time travel has, the playfulness offers that good potential for questioning and challenging stereotypes while seeking personal and shared identities. Um, so, um, the main difference between the case studies and, for example, living history is the emphasis on active participation, breaking down the boundary between the performer and the visitors. Um, why Viking? Well, you could do that this with any part of the past, really, any past culture, but Viking here has been chosen in these cases, not as clickbait. <laughs> I know Vikings are very hot, but there's a deeper reason. It's not just clickbait that, that made uh, these case studies choose to focus on the Viking culture. Um, it's because they are rooted in the locality where they are. So it's, it's the past of that particular place where this happens. Um, and why bring, in, why bring in Vikings at all when many of the pos positive outcomes can also be achieved through free leave, so hiking in nature without the time travel element, or, um, well, both of those, why Viking and why, why time travel at all, is because it, the, the Viking represents a central local identity where they are and carries a deeper meaning in that place, both in Orkney and in Norway. So by choosing Viking as the theme here, tourists are invited into a locally significant past. And indeed, March of the Magnus was a community event anyway. Um, but for the summer school versions of that, it was outsiders who were invited into a locally significant past, uh, allowed to connect with the place they're visiting. Um, so just to, to conclude at the end here, I would like to uh, look at this in the context of what Peter Varley called slow adventure. Without the fast paced adrenaline rush of adventure tourism and in contrast to the fragmented, accelerating, mediated experiment, experience of the hypermodern subject. So like in contrast to, for example, um, in Oslo, there is this um, uh, place you can go to to experience the Viking Age through, um, I think it's a 3D film. It's a kind of virtual immersion, and that's a that's a totally different type of immersion because it's still a hyper modern kind of form of immersion in the Viking Age. Whereas time travel here is is opposed to that. Um, it is a contrast to this hyper-modern, mediated, technology-mediated uh, experience and the everyday life we're living in. Slow adventure. Peter Varley writes about slow adventure without the time travel element. And he says slow adventure is aimed at insight seekers who want a rich, meaningful, potentially transcendent and intense experience through outdoor living and journeying, taking the form of spending an extended time in nature, um, emphasizes the experiential dimension of the journey where meaning and even spiritual feelings arise out of 
seemingly mundane activities such as walking, carrying, cooking, making shelter. It embraces commitment, uncertainty, natural hazards like the weather, for example, remoteness. And with all of that comes this increasing self-sufficiency that you're feeling at the, as the journey progresses. I can do this. I can survive. Um, time is felt. Um, so time is kind of woven into the landscape. Landscape, it's history, it's heritage, tradition, origin. So the, it's, the journey becomes a sort of passage. It's not just a journey, it's a passage. It's a, it includes the possibility of metamorphosis. So discover, the discovery of the real me, just as the hands-on history participants alluded to when they said that they had unlocked a new level or leveled up within themselves. Um, so this metamorphosis encompasses a new way of seeing, of appreciating something bigger, something timeless, seeing ourselves as part of an interconnected network of nature. And storytelling then, to bring in the time travel element again, um, in Orkney time travel, we do a lot of storytelling and we feel storytelling plays a very central role in explicitly anchoring the past, um, anchoring the experience we're doing in the landscape and in the past. Um, and that leads to this transformation of ways of seeing, such as in Viking Voyage to, to Hoi, where we tell stories that animate the landscape and give a time depth to them or martyrdom of St. Magnus, taking part and knowing that this happened here 900 years ago and emotionally connect with the character that you are from the past. Um, so the Viking Age way of seeing, experiencing, being in the world was profoundly different to our hypermodern Western mentalities. Um, and Experiencing that, even for a short time, for a couple of hours or a few days, helps us reorient ourselves as part of a network of nature and of time depth. The Vikings lived in an animated world with visible and invisible beings, where gifted people could shapeshift into animals, for example, and connected to realms of gods and giants um, through, through the world tree Yggdrasil. So these profoundly different mentalities can be made available to us through immersive time travel using storytelling and drama techniques in addition to what slow adventure already brings. Um, and all this is connected with authenticity. Authenticity, that elusive and very sought after quality in all tourism. Um, so the type of authenticity we're bringing here is that emotional, affective authenticity, that feeling of intentional clashes with modern expectations of comfort, um, cold, wet, hunger, perhaps even fear, is awoken then deliberately by placing yourself away from, from modernity. Um, so in time travel, unlike in theater, authenticity attempts to conceal or eliminate the mimetic principle. Um, so we're not just pretending, we're not acting. The aim is to be, just be there. Participants are not passive consumers, they're not audiences. They're actively invited to time travel, not looking in from the outside. Um, and there are opportunities to let them shape what happens. For example, when the young participants switched allegiance in the martyrdom of St. Magnus. Um, and that active participation opens up possibilities for inviting to reflection too. And I think this is important, an important part of challenging um, those ethical dilemmas that we talked about before. Um, so by inviting to reflection, we can resolve some of that tension around the image of the Viking and the sometimes negative aspects of, of Viking culture. Um, and we can also invite people to reflect on, personally reflect on how we want to live 
whether history ju just takes its course or or does it not and um, how a certain moment in the past is experienced differently by different people and um, and how the past is relevant for us today so there, therefore time travel engages us in collective meaning making that can be further enhanced by deliberately creating opportunities for participants to reflect during and after their time travel. So time travel is an ideal vehicle for active creative engagement with the past, encouraging reflection in a, about the present. Um, and for example, by contrast or by example, showing us values that we wish to take with us to the future. So summing up the conclusion here now is that uh, time travel contributes to a local sense of belonging and cohesion, as well as being part of a national and pan-European narratives and memoryscapes. Time travel shifts the emphasis from material evidence as the primary vehicle through which the past is understood to the bodily sensations, the personal experience, the emotional and the polyphonic co-created narrative where authenticity is subjective and it's effective. Um, and instead of remembering the past, it reawakens the past. So it's, it's both then and now at the same time. It connects with slow movements more broadly and especially the slow adventure tourism movement. Um, connection with nature, place and deep time contributes to personal growth, to reflection and sometimes metamorphosis, so this leveling up feeling. As a social practice, time travel deepens engagement with individual and collective identities and most importantly in a post or hypermodern existence, which can sometimes feel disconnected and meaningless. Time travel fulfills a need for meaning for enchantment and wonder. Thank you. So we have some time for questions now. If you if you want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat. And no questions in the chat. I'll stop recording. Well, maybe you'll find it easier to ask questions if I'm not recording. <laughs>